previous talk on functionally single ventricle to discuss the assessment of these patients after they've had their primary and secondary repairs and their tertiary repairs because they are patients we have to follow for the rest of life. Uh, Dr. Cohen uh, is uh, previously been the, the head of the ultrasound laboratory, is now in charge of the fellowship program at the Children's Hospital, and she's a great authority, and we're very privileged to have her here with us today. Meryl. Thank you, Norman. Uh, just to be clear, I'm only going to be talking today about um, after the first stage palliation. <clears throat> I think it would be much too long a talk to talk about the Glen and the Fontan, so that could be for another time. Um, can you see my slides, Norman? Perfect. Okay, wonderful. Uh, Perfect. Good afternoon and potentially good evening to all of you who are with us today. Thank you for joining. Um, I, am, <clears throat> I haven't seen you all for a while. It's very nice to be here again. Um, I want to thank um, Norman and Gil and Sasha and uh, Grace for always putting these wonderful programs together. And I hope uh, if you have not been vaccinated already that that will soon occur for all of you. So I'm going to talk to you today about imaging after the first stage surgery for single ventricle and really make this just a very practical guide. When you're thinking about single ventricle palliation, um, there, in any single ventricle chamber or potentially a functional single ventricle chamber um, can present in one of four ways after birth. And that can be either um, the patient can have isolated pulmonary outflow obstruction. And in that case, the, the patient would require a, a modified Blalock Taussig shunt or since in, in the last half decade or so, we've been doing uh, patent ductus arteriosus stents in some of these patients. An example, an anatomical example of a patient who might need that is any type of single ventricle that has pulmonary atresia or very severe pulmonary stenosis that's ductal dependent. You can also have a clinical scenario where both outflows are unobstructed in single ventricle. And in that case, a pulmonary artery band might be needed because the physiology of those patients is essentially a large VSD. So as the pulmonary vascular resistance drops, the patient will go into heart failure. And if left unrepaired, potentially can develop pulmonary vascular disease. So we have to limit their pulmonary blood flow. And a, clinic, and a uh, pathologic example of that is double outlet right ventricle with mitral atresia in which the patient does not have pulmonary outflow obstruction nor arch obstruction. The most common thing and what we'll spend most of our time talking about today are the patients who have aortic outflow obstruction. And so in those cases, they can either undergo a Norwood procedure or a hybrid procedure. And that includes uh, HLHS and its variants, as well as double inlet ventricle with transposition and arch hypoplasia and tricuspid atresia with transposition and arch hypoplasia. All will undergo a similar type of repair. And then finally, you can have uh, the clinical scenario where both outflows are obstructed in single ventricle. And this is very poorly tolerated. This can cause fetal demise or neonatal demise, and we really don't have a good surgical palliation for these patients. And in fact, the only thing we could likely offer them is a heart transplant if they make it that far. So the goals of the first stage of palliation for any patient with single ventricle is really to mimic the fetal single ventricle circulation. Uh, most patients who have single ventricle in utero tolerate it quite well unless they have a lot of AV valve regurgitation and can make it to term. And so we're providing uh, a pathway uh, very similar to that by doing this first operation. And so our goals are to provide unobstructed systemic blood flow from the single ventricle to the descending aorta to provide uh, adequate uh, cardiac output, unobstructed flow from the pulmonary veins getting back to the ventricle itself, and then a reliable source of pulmonary blood flow. And that can either be the BT shunt, the RV to PA conduit, PDA stent, or there are the rare patients who have just enough native pulmonary stenosis that they may not require a first palliation at all. <clears throat> 
Uh, and so what are we thinking about looking at from an echocardiographic standpoint when we think about uh, imaging these patients after their first palliation? Well, the atrial communication, again, getting pulmonary veins to the ventricle. So if there is left AV valve atresia or stenosis, then that atrial communication becomes critically important. AV valve function, ventricular performance, semilunar valve function, and then proximal and distal arch, uh, particularly in those patients who have undergone the Norwood procedure, and then the source of pulmonary blood flow, the uh, BT shunt, uh, PDA stent, or pulmonary artery band function. And finally, the branch pulmonary arteries. What's essential about these patients is that you need to follow their echoes serially because there can be subtle changes that portend complications and you might be able to pick them up if you compare their echoes side by side as they uh, age. I'm not gonna spend too much time on this particular slide only to show you that each view that we do uh, in the standard pediatric echocardiogram <clears throat> provides excellent information about a variety of uh, the areas of the heart that I just described to you. And so this will be in the video and you can uh, spend more time on it if needed. So let's start with the uh, atrial communication. So um, the atrial communication uh, is again critical in those patients who have left AV valve inflow uh, narrowing or atresia. And, uh, and so that will dictate whether the atrial communication is important or not. For example, a patient with double inlet left ventricle with two good sized AV valves, the atrial communication is not as important. And so those, in those who do have left AV valve restriction, there is a risk for postoperative atrial septal restriction in those who have a very small left atrium, in those who have a restrictive or intact uh, atrial septum preoperatively, um, there is a subset of patients who have posterior deviation of the septum primum. Uh, and uh, it, because there's just not enough space in the left atrium when it's small, an LSVC to coronary sinus can also uh, obstruct flow in this way. And this, uh, the atrial septum in general is best uh, assessed in the sub xiphoid view. Uh, and you can actually get a very nice uh, CW or PW Doppler, which uh, we use to assess the mean gradient across the atrial septum as a means to determine obstruction. And so why are we so concerned about intact atrial septum? Well, in HLHS, it's a very significant risk factor for poor outcome. This is mostly the work done by my colleague, Jack Reichick and some of the fellows he's worked with, but you can see that if you have a mildly restrictive atrial communication, um, your survival rate is much higher compared to those who have intact or nearly intact atrial septum. Their cum cumulative survival is significantly decreased. And why is this? Well, if you look at the actual pathology in these patients, if they have an open atrial septum, their pulmonary veins are, are very uh, thin and normal appearing. But when you have an intact atrial septum, they get arterialization of their pulmonary veins and of the endothelial tissue. And what that means is that they have pulmonary vascular disease that even if you open the atrial septum does not change significantly and can be a long-term risk factor. Here are some echocardiographic examples in the sub xiphoid view of a variety of risk factors for atrial restriction. Here you see a patient who has an extremely tiny left atrium in HLHS because the patient also has total anomalous pulmonary venous connection. And so you could see that trying to make an atrial septal hole in that situation and bringing the pulmonary vein confluence to that part of the atrium could be quite challenging. Here you see that deviated uh, septum primum. And we know uh, by leaving these alone in patients who have the hybrid procedure that that atrial, uh, atrial septal uh, communication can get smaller over time. And here's that real estate issue I was talking about earlier. This is a patient with HLHS who also has an LSBC to coronary sinus, which is just taking up so much space that the atrial septum is restrictive. And why do we care about this? Because restrictive atrial septum uh, means that the blood in the left atrium can't get to the ventricle and that causes a back pressure. So they get high pulmonary artery pressure, potentially decreased flow in their shunt, and of course, marked cyanosis. Uh, 
And here you see a mean Doppler gradient of 12 millimeters of mercury, indicating that there's fairly significant uh, obstruction in this patient. We'll move on now to the AV valve. Uh, here you see a patient uh, with HLHS who has tricuspid valve prolapse. You can see the valve prolapsing into the atrium. And so risk factors for AV valve regurgitation in this population of single ventricle, including having a common AV valve, preoperative AV valve regurgitation, obviously if you have it before the surgery, you're likely to have it after, tricuspid valve dysplasia or prolapse, which we see fairly frequently in HLHS, and then if a ventricle is dilated or dysfunctional, these patients can also develop functional tricuspid or AV valve regurgitation. And arch obstruction, uh, subtle arch obstruction can present with a change in AV valve regurgitation. And this is best assessed in the apical four chamber view as you see here, but also the parasternal long axis view. And 3D imaging has really enhanced our understanding of these abnormalities. And so here are just some examples of mild, moderate, and severe tricuspid regurgitation in the setting of HLHS. You can see it's probably caused by a variety of mechanisms. In this case, in this case over here, the severe case, uh, the patient had tricuspid valve dysplasia. And what's important to know is that significant AV valve regurgitation in the setting of single ventricle is always in every study you look at a predictor of outcome, a predictor of worse outcome. And there is variable progression of this AV valve regurgitation. So it's important to continue to monitor it over time and to compare patients' images uh, side by side to see if it's progressing. Um, I mentioned that 3D imaging has really enhanced our understanding of the mechanisms of uh, AV valve regurgitation and single ventricle. And here are just some examples where you see an excessive uh, scallop and buckling of the anterior leaflet, a small posterior leaflet. And uh, in any patient uh, in our institution who has significant AV valve regurgitation coming to their Glenn procedure, we do a very uh, uh, extensive 3D uh, analysis while they're um, under sedation uh, for their procedure. Of course, we're, if you only have one ventricle, you have to worry that it's working. And there are a variety of risk factors for uh, dysfunction uh, in this setting, including if the patient had preoperative dysfunction, which rarely we see, and we can see even in fetal life. Uh, any perioperative complications, such as a long bypass run or multiple bypass runs can lead to this problem. <clears throat> AV valve regurgitation and ventricular dysfunction come somewhat hand in hand. And then there are a small subset of patients, particularly those who have complete heart block, who will have ventricular non-compaction in this setting and that will set them at risk for uh, ventricular dysfunction. <clears throat> and then there's always the concern about coronary cameral fistulae, both in the PAIVS um, patients as well as the HLHS patients. And arch obstruction uh, is a herald dysfunction. So if you see a uh, dysfunction that's uh, occurred in a patient who had normal function uh, in single ventricle, then you should always look at their arch to be sure that there's no obstruction. <clears throat> and this is best assessed in the apical four chamber and parasternal short axis view. And I just bring your attention to, uh, this is uh, what we're looking at is sort of the eyeball uh, means of uh, assessing ventricular function, but there are many quantitative ways to assess function these days. And here's just a small list. And this is uh, uh, a talk in, in and of itself. So I won't spend too much time on this. Then just make working your way through the heart, <clears throat> we get to the neonatal, the semilunar valve and <clears throat> risk factors for Semilunar valve regurgitation include an abnormal valve to begin with. And in the early postoperative period, it's a pretty unusual finding, but you can see it when there's distortion of the uh, DKS or the aortic to pulmonary artery anastomosis, uh, or if the RV to PA conduit is placed a little bit too close to the neo aortic valve, and that can distort the valve as well. <clears throat> this tends to be more a long term problem meaning we see it in older patients after their Fontan. And there are a small uh, group of patients who now have required semilunar valve replacement in this setting. Uh, this is best assessed in the apical five chamber view, as well as the parasternal long and short axis view. <clears throat> 
This is another uh, fairly uncommon problem, proximal arch obstruction, really in the setting of the Norwood procedure. Um, and it's really a surgical issue um, because of uh, how the suture line is made for the aortic to pulmonary artery anastomosis. But just, uh, just as with distal arch obstruction, it can cause ventricular dysfunction as well as uh, valve regurgitation. And it's best assessed in the five chamber view, apical five chamber view as well as long and short axis. You can see it's usually not terribly severe. If it were severe, the patient would probably not be able to come off cardiopulmonary bypass and would have to be repaired right, in, right then and there. And now distal arch obstruction. Now this is a much more common uh, and serious problem. It occurs in up to 30% of patients before their second stage. So of course we're talking about patients who have had their arch um, intervened on <clears throat> in some way. And it can be quite challenging to diagnose by transthoracic echocardiography for a number of reasons. The, if, you, if the patient has a blalock tausig shunt, uh, that provides runoff, and so you won't see the diastolic runoff that we classically see in the two ventricle repair patients who have coarctation. Uh, by definition, patients who have this type of arch repair often have a very large caliber transverse arch that then becomes much smaller at the descending aorta. And so just by physics, the patient has to have acceleration of flow in that area. So determining whether it's true obstruction or not can be challenging. And so we're often faced with uh, both false positive and false negatives uh, in this clinical setting. Distal arch obstruction in the setting of single ventricle uh, can cause very significant morbidity, including ventricular dysfunction and AV valve regurgitation. <clears throat> and of course, it's seen best in the suprasternal imaging, but we also pay attention to the Doppler of the abdominal aorta for the pulsatility to help us determine if, we, if there's a dampened signal there that the patient may have coarctation. And here are just some examples of suprasternal imaging in a variety of patients, none of whom here have arch obstruction. So you see here a tortuous arch uh, with multiple uh, folds in the patch, yet there's no obstruction. And here's this uh, a very uh, marked example of a very large transverse arch, which then uh, becomes much smaller when it reaches the normal size descending aorta. And again, there's a little fold in the patch here, and this is where the patient's at risk to develop obstruction but has not developed it. And here's an example of a really nicely put together transverse and descending aorta uh, anastomosis in a patient with, with HLHS where the patch really is just right. There's no folding uh, and obviously no obstruction. So how do we make the determination of arch obstruction in this population of patients? We look for a couple of things. We look for an acute transition of laminar flow to turbulent flow, as you see here on the left. Uh, and we also look for a high velocity uh, pattern without runoff. And so here's an example where the maximum velocity is three at peak gradient to 40. And you see that there's no diastolic run runoff whatsoever. We did a study a number of years ago uh, at CHOP where we tried to determine um, echo factors that uh, help us uh, predict if the patient has recoarctation after a Norwood procedure. And these were the risk factors that came up for us, distal arch velocity greater than 2.5 meters per second, a coarctation index less than 0.7, which I'll get into in a moment, and if there is a decrement of uh, right ventricular performance. And we assign points depending on the odds ratio. Here's what the coarctation index looks like. We measure the diameter of the narrowest region of the arch compared to the normal size descending aorta. So less than 0.7 is considered coarctation. And you can see that this system of points that we've developed, this echo score composite, if you will, uh, really works very well with an area under the ROC curve of 0.96. So a very good sensitivity and specificity. And we found that the composite score worked very well, whether you had a BT shunt or an RV to PA conduit. And so when we start to see any of these factors in our patients, we tend to send them to the cath lab for re-intervention. I'm now gonna switch uh, gears a little bit and talk about the shunt types that we see in patients who undergo the Norwood procedure, the BT shunt uh, seen here, 
uh, and the RV to PA uh, shunt seen here. Um, but I will say that um, I was watching Gray's Anatomy, an American television show a number of years ago, and they posed the question about these shunts as well. So I'll let them explain it to you. First step in the Norwood is the cardiopulmonary bypass. With HLHS, what else do you get besides hyperplasia of the ventricle? Stenosis or atresia of the mitral and aortic valves. Why are we using the RVPA conduit instead of the modified blade lactosic shunt? It limits diastolic runoff. Well, you've done your homework. I thought that was quite amazing that they knew the answer to that question. So there must have been a pediatric cardiology consultant uh, on the show. So the modified blaylock tausig shunt has advantages and disadvantages. One of the big advantages is, of course, that we've been doing it for 30 to 40 years and actually longer if you count doing it for tetralogy of Fallot from the 1940s onward with, uh, with the work done by Blaylock and Tausick and Thomas. Um, but I'm just going to highlight a few of these features, <clears throat> and two, uh, th three of the most important features are that the advantages are that it generally does not distort the pulmonary arteries if you put in a BT shunt, and it does not require you putting a hole in the ventricle, in the one ventricle you have. We know putting holes in ventricles are bad things from our tetralogy of Fallot patients who get ventricular tachycardia, and that's certainly a concern in this population. One of the major disadvantages is what you just heard in that video from Gray's Anatomy, which is that it re results in diastolic runoff. Um, and so that causes lower diastolic pressure and potentially uh, causes uh, problems with coronary perfusion and has always been thought to be one of the factors that causes interstage mortality in this population. How do we image these patients? Uh, well, you can actually, in your suprasternal scanning, image from the, sorry, I'm trying to get this uh, video to work, uh, from the anominate artery to the proximal uh, right pulmonary artery. Uh, and narrowing can be difficult to diagnose by echocardiography, uh, but we can also do a 3D uh, angiogram, if you will. Um, so this is a 3D echo where we've taken away the 2D and only see the color. And it could show you if there's any narrowing in any region of the BT shunt. Uh, it can be difficult to estimate the pulmonary artery pressure this way. So I would warn against that because the modified Bernoulli equation does not apply because of all of the factors, including viscosity. And it's really best assessed in the suprasternal frontal sweep. And here, finally, the clip is working. And you can follow this BT shunt from the PAs here making its way all the way back up to the anomalous artery. So you can see, you can sort of move your probe and see the entire shunt this way. So how do we determine if it's obstructed? Well, sometimes we'll see that the, an area along the shunt looks pinched in by 2D in color, and it could be anywhere in the proximal, middle, or distal regions. And then the Doppler pattern is also a clue you'll have a lower velocity proximal to the obstruction and a higher velocity distal to the obstruction. And here is this sort of double envelope, if you will, of pre and post obstruction in a patient, in that patient with a um, uh, narrowing in the shunt. The RV to PA conduit is our other strategy of a shunt for patients who have neuro procedure and has really sort of for the last 20 years, probably been a very significant uh, a method of providing this pulmonary blood flow. It also has a number of advantages and disadvantages, but I'll just highlight a few. Uh, the most important advantage is that it does not cause diastolic runoff. And so this is a true benefit, particularly in patients uh, who don't have any anti-grade flow across their aortic valves or aortic atresia. Some of the disadvantages, it can distort, it distort the pulmonary arteries uh, as you put in that shunt and as time goes on, it can sort of contract and pull the pulmonary arteries with it. And of course, as I alluded to for the BT shunt, you do in fact have to put a hole in the ventricle. And this is a concern for future dysfunction of the ventricle uh, and arrhythmias. How do we image this? It often can't be seen in one view. Uh, and so the conduit uh, also can be very difficult to see without color because it's very anterior in the chest. 
Usually the velocity across this area is about three to four meters per second of anti-grade flow with some retrograde flow in diastole. And it's best assessed in the peristernal long and short view. And you can often see it in, as you sweep anteriorly in the uh, sub-xiphoid view. Again, you see here, you really have to move your probe along to get the entire uh, shunt in your view. Obstructed conduits can be a bit tricky. Um, you tend to see that laminar low velocity flow instead of the three to four meters per second. As I mentioned, again, serial echocardiograms help you with this. If the patient started out with four meters per second and is now only one meter per second, then something is wrong. And that can either mean that the shunt is obstructed or there's high pulmonary artery pressure. And uh, obstructed uh, um, narrowing of the RV to PA conduit can occur anywhere along the conduit, proximately where it comes out of the right ventricle as it turns towards the uh, outflow, uh, the distal part of it as it's connected to the branch pulmonary arteries, any of those places. So which one is better, the BT shunt or the RV to PA conduit? Uh, the Pediatric Heart Network took this on about uh, over a decade ago now um, by doing the single ventricle reconstruction trial. And what they found with that was that there was an early survival benefit for the RV to PA conduit. Their survival was 74% compared to 64%. Uh, and you can see that in this, uh, this uh, survival curve on the, on the right. But that benefit really disappears by 12 months of age, and there's really no difference by uh, six years of age. So you can see uh, in the bottom curve that there's a difference in the beginning, but that difference goes away uh, over time. There are more unintended, uh, unintended, excuse me, interventions in the RV to PA conduit group compared to the BT shunt group, pr probably rel mostly related to the branch pulmonary arteries becoming distorted. And importantly, ventricular size and function and AV valve regurgitation are not different between the shunt groups, at least thus far. This cohort uh, continues to be followed and is now about 10 or 11 years old. And so we're gonna collect more and more information as they age. I'm just briefly gonna touch on whether a patient has a PDA stent or not. Again, this is in patients who have isolated ductal dependent pulmonary blood flow. There is essentially no published data on echocardiography in this cohort of patients. Uh, but we do get concerned about these PDA stents with regard to uh, isolated pulmonary artery stenosis. One of the pulmonary arteries may become narrowed um, from the stent. Uh, jailing of the, of the pulmonary artery by the stent if the stent is pushed into the one, one of the pulmonary arteries um, and, um, and sort of blocks the other one. And you can have instant narrowing from intimal proliferation or even from clot. <clears throat> and the best views we use are suprasternal and subxiphoid to assess this. And I think the jury is still out on ECHO's role in assessing these stents serial. But we, uh, again, serial assessment is always gonna be helpful to compare to the previous one. And then just another brief mention about the pulmonary artery band in those patients who have no pulmonary outflow tract obstruction. Uh, or aortic obstruction. Again, serial echo assessment always key. Um, pulmonary artery bands can migrate towards the branch pulmonary arteries. They can be too close to the pulmonary valve and cause pulmonary regurgitation, and they can distort one branch pulmonary artery, not the other. And so you may have a band that migrates to one pulmonary artery, leading to stenosis of that one, leaving the other one at high systemic pressure at systemic pressure and causing pulmonary vascular disease in that one. So it's very important to con continue to monitor these patients serially over time, even though it's a relatively minor procedure. And the best views for this are the apical four chamber view, parasternal long and short axis, and sub xiphoid short axis. I'm now going to uh, end the talk by talking about the hybrid procedure. Um, this is generally performed in high risk patients with HLHS or its variants who may not tolerate cardiopulmonary bypass or circulatory arrest. So cohorts include very small or premature infants, patients who have other uh, congenital anomalies, uh, or if there's a late diagnosis. And it can be used as a bridge to cardiac transplant uh, for a variety of patients. So if a patient, for example, has a lot of AV valve regurgitation, we don't think they're gonna make it to Fontan, 
we can use the hybrid uh, as they're waiting for transplant. And potentially it avoids high PRA levels. It can also be used as a bridge to biventricular repair. If you have a very small infant who's gonna require a complex uh, biventricular repair, uh, an example is interrupted aortic arch with VSD in whom the patient may require a Yasui procedure, uh, then you can perform this uh, hybrid procedure in anticipation of that being done when they're bigger. And some institutions use the hybrid as their primary strategy to treat HLHS. Uh, what's the outcome difference between the Norwood and the hybrid? Well, there really is not a significant difference in survival if you look at the data that's come out of Toronto Sick Kids program, uh, but there is a higher intervention rate after the hybrid procedure. So what does it entail? It's a surgery and transcatheter intervention surgery to place the pulmonary artery bands, transcatheter intervention for the rest. Most importantly, a ductal stent is placed to provide that unobstructed flow from the ventricle to the aorta. And then the branch pulmonary arteries are banded to limit pulmonary blood flow. And then the atrial septum may require intervention, including septostomy or stent, again, to provide unobstructed flow from the pulmonary veins to the ventricle as we described in the beginning. And then at the second stage, Archery construction and bidirectional gland are performed then. So how do we assess the hybrid by echocardiography? There are components of it that are similar to the Norwood. Uh, we look for change in ventricular function and AV valve regurgitation. And we know that these portend complications in this cohort of patients. But there are some very unique features of the hybrid that we need to assess including for atrial septal defect restriction because that can happen over time. Remember in the Norwood procedure, one component is removing the atrial septum. We have to assess pulmonary, uh, the PDA stent patency as well as pulmonary artery band velocities and, and assess for reverse coarctation. And I'll touch upon that, what that means in a minute. And similar to the Norwood, serial assessment of these patients is critical. So here is the atrial stent in these patients. The atrial septum in HLHS in the hybrid can become more restrictive over time. So if you don't address the atrial septum in the, in the intervention in the beginning, it needs to be assessed because over time, the atrial septum can become restrictive, particularly patients who have deviated septum primum. Um, and so um, a stent is a more reliable way of keeping that uh, atrial septum open than balloon dilation, but both are often done. Um, and we can assess the flow within the stent itself to see if that's developing intimal proliferation and needs to be redilated. Um, and these are best performed in the sub xiphoid views, similar to any other atrial assessment that we perform. An important uh, teaching point is that if the pulmonary artery band gradients are decreasing over time, then you should suspect atrial septal restriction. The PDA stent, here's a really nice example that you see on the right-hand side, is a stent from the main pulmonary artery to the descending aorta crossing over the aortic isthmus. And that's important, uh, which I'll tell you in a moment. Complications uh, in the PDA stent are you can obviously develop clot in it. Um, you can have proximal obstruction at the MPA or distal obstruction at the aorta. And uh, there's the risk of reverse coarctation. This is best assessed in the high parasternal, what we call the ductal view. And we also Doppler in the descending aorta. And here you see nice laminar flow, anagrade flow, like you would see in a, right after birth in a patient with a large ductus with HLHS. And then you have the retrograde flow in diastole as we would typically see if the pulmonary vascular bed was healthy. Here are some examples of complications. You can see on your left here that there's some clot within uh, this PDA stent here. So there's stent thrombus here. Here you see a patient who has distal obstruction. You can see the stent is up against the descending aorta causing narrowing there. Uh, and you, in this other one, you can see that the stent is unfortunately too far proximal in the MPA and is up against the wall of the MPA and causing obstruction there. So you can have a variety of problems that you need to assess. So what is reverse coarctation? I keep referring to it. 
And in the patients, particularly who have no anagrade flow across their aortic valve. So the, this is a major concern, particularly in patients who have aortic atresia. The way that the blood is able to get to the coronary arteries is retrograde through the transverse arch. So the isthmus is here, and you can see that the PDA stent, I'm sorry for my immature drawing, but the PDA stent crosses the isthmus and is actually across it, and the blood has to go through the struts of the stent to go retrograde into the coronary arteries. So the isthmus itself can narrow over time uh, as the patient ages, uh, and the PDA stent itself may obstruct this flow. So limited flow from the PDA stent to the ascending aorta, again, particularly in patients who have aortic atresia, will result in coronary artery ischemia, obviously a bad thing. So here's two side-by-side -side examples, one without reverse coarctation and one with. You can see it's pretty subtle. So this patient, uh, the transverse arch is seen here, and you can see laminar flow. Uh, in the Doppler, in the transverse arch, you can see this retrograde flow, which is then making its way back to the coronary arteries, no obstruction. Whereas here you can see subtle acceleration of flow, turbulent flow, uh, and that uh, is resulting in isthmus obstruction. And so here are the consequences of such reverse coarctation. You can get a patient who had good function that becomes serially dysfunctional, uh, and uh, you can see the development of significant AV valve regurgitation, and that may herald that the patient has coronary ischemia on that, and that needs to be addressed. And so what do you do in this situation? Well, the cath doctors are able to actually put a stent within the stent in these patients. So they can put a stent through the side of the PDA stent. Here you're looking at it on FAS. Uh, and you can see it here as well. And that uh, provides uh, unobstructed flow retrograde uh, towards the um, uh, ascending aorta and into the coronary arteries. Um, the pulmonary artery bands also require serial assessment and complications of the bands, including imbalance of flow, meaning one is too loose and one is too tight. <clears throat> they can also both be too loose or too tight. If they're too loose, the patient can have heart failure and develop pulmonary vascular disease. If they're too tight, the patient will be quite cyanotic. And we have to pay attention to a changes in Doppler gradients because these may herald a problem with the hybrid physiology. They're best assessed in the parasternal view, in the suprasternal and subxiphoid. Anywhere you can see them uh, is, is wonderful. And you try to line up your Doppler as, as parallel as you can to the, uh, to the jet so that you can get accurate pressure gradients. Here's an example of how serial assessment can show you changes. This was a patient with HLHS who had a variant with LV dysplasia, so had a relatively big LV. And over time, the LA and LV were becoming more dilated uh, because the atrial septum was becoming more restrictive. And what you can see here is two weeks after the pulmonary artery band, the velocity across the band was about three meters per second. Uh, and four weeks after the ban, you've seen it's gone back to let, gone down to less than two meters per second. And this patient develops severe atrial septal restriction. So serial assessment, again, uh, take home message is essential. So in conclusion, single ventricle palliation has enabled the survival of thousands of children. Um, the advantage of one interventional strategy over others remains to be seen. Uh, so far, the BT shunt and the RV to PA conduit seem to be fairly matched in uh, survival of patients. And the hybrid and the stage one also don't seem to have significant differences right now. Transthoracic echo, I hope I've demonstrated to you today, um, can demonstrate most complications of the Norwood and the hybrid procedures as well as uh, other shunts that we perform. And again, the take home message is that serial assessment is essential to detect sometimes subtle changes and then more severe changes in function, valve function, uh, and shunt uh, integrity. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Marion.
Thank you, we have, uh, Meryl. We have that was great. Wilberman ready for the comment, I'm sure. Well, uh, there, there's hardly a comment that can be made other than bravo. Uh, Meryl, that was a be really beautiful talk, uh, very comprehensive. And uh, I think, as I've said about all of these talks, is thank heaven that we have the Congenital Heart Academy website on YouTube, which allows us to go back and listen again and digest very carefully what you've said. Your talk was absolutely outstanding. A couple of things that uh, I think were interested me was uh, your use of um, the uh, color flow uh, almost uh, uniformly as a, uh, a way of looking at the BT shunt yeah. and the anastomosis of the pulmonary arteries. And I, I found that very useful, but I think it also requires a little bit extra skill yes. because uh, when you want to look at uh, flow velocity where you fill the vessel, you have to lower the scale appropriately to make this done. And uh, I, I say this only as a form of uh, education for people that are, are interested in doing that. You have to lower the, the scale to an appropriate level where you can fill up the pulmonary arteries. And, and I thought that you showed that beautifully. Uh, as well, um, I think that this uh, interesting issue of the hybrid procedure and the complications that come from the hybrid procedure are very, very important to assess. The other question that comes to mind in this is, of course, uh, echo is a wonderful technique. Uh, you and I would never have an argument about that. But in this condition, and I think that this is what um, uh, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia has done such a, an amazing job, and all of your colleagues, at actually looking at all of these uh, variables on a scientific basis and have looked at all of the different issues. And I'm sure that um, you would be the first to endorse the fact that um, echocardiography is only one of the means for making the assessment of these conditions. It's obviously the first uh, forefront of the clinical examination. And I think that, uh, you know, I'd like you to say something about the addition of uh, of uh, CT scanning. And of course, when you've got a lot of metal, et cetera, in the place, MRI becomes uh, less valuable. But I think that I, I'd, I'd address uh, you to answer those questions right now. Sure. <clears throat> um, yeah, this is obviously, ECHO is not the only modality we use in the assessment of these patients. However, um, it's something we can do quickly, we can do frequently, and we can uh, assess side by side all the time. So our standard in all our single ventricle patients is that essentially they get an echo every two weeks. Um, and we do, uh, in some cases, a focal fo focused echo. And at least once a month, we do a comprehensive echo where we look at all of the components. And again, this is just to help us understand if something is changing, if we're seeing a change in function or seeing a change in valve regurgitation. Then if we're concerned about that, <clears throat> other modalities are very important. Certainly CT is exceedingly important in the PDA stent population, um, both before you put the stent in to really look at the anatomy of the PDA to assess whether the, the cath doctors feel that they can actually put a stent in there and the patients who have multiple bends and turns in their, in their uh, PDAs, uh, it can be quite a challenge for the cath doctors to put the stents in there. And then after um, we use CT and sometimes even MRI to assess these areas. One thing that MRI can do even when there are stents in place is tell you the difference in pulmonary blood flow so to, each, you know, to each lung. So if we're worried that one PA is getting too much and one PA is not getting enough in a hybrid or um, in a patient who's had a stent put in, then that's one of the means that we can use to assess that. And of course, it shows us other things like you know, myocardium integrity. It can give us a regurgitant fraction when we're worried about AV valve regurgitation. So these are all complementary, all of these, in, you know, before you even get to cath. Um, but I think echo is sort of the, the, the thing that holds them all together. 
in that we can do it frequently and serially um, to help us understand if something's coming, if something's starting to brew. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's a wonderful point. And another great point that you made is the ability to assess ventricular function. And one of the, the issues that we've discovered with this condition is if you have even a minimal coarctation, the ventricle, which is already uh, compromised in terms of doing the work of two, uh, really gives up uh, its function a lot more rapidly. And so that any change in ventricular function requires a total evaluation of these patients. Would you agree? I totally agree. And uh, we even, we're fairly aggressive about treating coarctation in this population, even when the gradient is not very significant for that exact reason. These ventricles are extremely vulnerable. They're already volume loaded because of the shunt. Uh, and now if you pressure load them from arch obstruction, you really can uh, be, get into some serious trouble very quickly. And this is one of the most, one of the preventable uh, forms of ventricular dysfunction, right? If you start out inherently with bad myocardium, like if in fetal life there's bad myocardium or there's bad AV valve regurgitation that's hard to treat, there isn't, there aren't that all that many options, but arch obstruction is something we can really address pretty aggressively in this population. And so we're, we're, we're fairly aggressive about it for that exact reason that you described. Can, can I ask for the benefit of everybody here and perhaps Sasha will chime in, what is your preference for um, uh, the repair of hyperplastic left heart syndrome? Do you have a, a uh, are you doing both repairs? Uh, is there a special reason why you choose one over the other and a hybrid? When, when do you go to the hybrid? Yeah, the question is uh, good, but uh, our center is a uh, hybrid center. So mm -hmm. we don't use to you as a Norwood as first uh, stage, but all the patients receive uh, uh, hybrid. As uh, mm -hmm. I was happy when uh, Mary put that uh, some center uh, use this uh, procedure. There are uh, two or three cases where we go directly for Norwood. I think that uh, reverse coartation, I will, uh, this was the question for Mary. G generally, we are able to see before mm -hmm. we use the stand. There is something we call the tree sign. You, saw, you show a fantastic drawing that was typical that uh, when you have reverse coartation, uh, when uh, it's possible to see preoperatively before decision, we go directly with for the for the normal. Of course, there are uh, uh, these uh, diseases still remain very challenging. And yeah. If we add a new technique, a new choice like hybrid, it means that we are already not full resolve uh, the 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 surgical approach for the disease. I'm sure when you talk from the CHOP experience and you talk about hybrid, they can uh, kill you because uh, we know very well how is important the learning curve, uh, the way how to approach. And Meryl is a big, big uh, witness of, uh, I'm sure, a lot of experience. So the idea is that the first question for Meryl is uh, if there is uh, the way to prevent or to see on the echo the, the reverse coartation before you decide for a stand or not stand. We reduce the use of stent and we use a pulmonary artery bending plus prostaglandin in our patient. And um, because of, uh, as uh, Meryl said, the, the standing of the PDA, every PDA is different from each other. We use this technique for not only uh, single band, it means for hypoplastic, but we use in uh, heterogeneous population of patients. And sometimes the stent uh, is uh, working in, in a different way. So the second question is uh, how you consider the stenting of the PDA and how is the impact of the echo evaluation? If we have a problem with stent or coartation, we go, we don't make another, an additional uh, strategy from cat lab. We go directly for normal. We have the rule of six weeks. It means mm 
if in the first six weeks we have a complication coming from PDA, stenting, bending, we go directly for Norwood. So this okay. is, uh, of course... Uh, you convert them to a Norwood in that situation, yeah. Yes. So the, the, the other point is, uh, if you think that uh, coming inside for a new intervention uh, in a hybrid case is something that uh, makes sense, and in your experience, how is the quality of results of uh, plasty of the valve at the first stage when you have uh, moderate to severe tricuspid or uh, valve, single valve insufficiency? All right, but there's a lot of questions, so I... <laughs> I was waiting for this, I write everything. <laughs> yeah, so, so uh, Norman originally asked like what we do, right? So we primarily um, do the Norwood procedure for, a, for HLHS and its variants. And we tend to do um, the RV to PA conduit in the patients with aortic atresia for the, because of the subtype analysis that was done by the PHN. So we followed sort of what happened in that study, saw that the aortic atresia patients did better with the RV to PA conduit. That was sort of the one group that did a little better. So we tend to use the conduit for them and we use a BT shunt often in other patients unless there's an arch anomaly, you know, that you can't, you know, one or the other can't be used. So, so we tend to do hybrids for the higher risk patients. And so our hybrid outcome is probably not as good as yours, Sasha, because every hybrid we do is in a patient who already has risk factors that have mm -hmm. nothing to do with the hybrid. So prematurity, small, you know, small for gestational age, uh, other additional anomalies, um, you know, genetic defects, things like that. So we already are like starting with a population that's very different than the patients who have the Norwood procedure. Um, and so because of that, we're more aggressive about leaving them as a hybrid than converting them to a Norwood. So it's all about how, you know, what you're comfortable doing and what works for your institution and where, how you have the best outcomes. You know, yeah. we had very good BT shunt outcomes when I started as a fellow and through, throughout my career. The RV to PA conduit, we had to all adapt and get used to it. It tended to be used in institutions that didn't have good results with the BT shunt. And, and there's a variety of reasons for that. So, you know, I think people should use whichever, you know, whichever procedure works best for them. Um, so that's so that's what I would say about um, sort of the strategy. Our cath doctors are pretty good about the stent and stent. And the one thing I would say about trying to predict whether they have reverse coarctation, the, the anatomy of the isthmus is very different from patient to patient, and it's sort of a, it's sort of about how it attaches into the descending aorta if it comes mm -hmm. directly in or it comes in at an angle. That really can determine if it's going to get smaller over time. Um, yes. And so, so it really is an anatomical issue. Paul Weinberg always taught me that there, was, there were anatomical issue, differences between uh, patients. So the hybrid for us is most successful in the patients who have anagrade flow across their aorta. So if they, like, for example, an unbalanced AV canal, with arch obstruction is a perfect patient for the hybrid because you don't have to worry about the atrial septum because they have a big primum defect and you don't have to worry about the isthmus because they have anagrade flow. So, so those are you know, sort of the, the model patients to do it in because those types of complications may not develop in them. Sure, okay, cool. I think uh, there's a couple of interesting issues here and I'd like to uh, kind of contain the, uh, the questions um, just to bring to the minds of uh, all of our listeners today is that uh, we lost the great Paul Weinberg recently, and we also lost the great Bill Norwood. So uh, in a way, uh, these sessions are kind of a, a tribute to, to them and their, their uh, outstanding efforts. But I wanted to um, just uh, ask, uh, we should uh, hear what the attendees have to say and uh, uh, let's get to an anonymous attendee first. You said you mentioned that the RVPA conduit can lead to more cyanosis than the modified blade octalsic shunt. Why? Yeah, so that is, it's not because of the shunt itself. It's, uh, so I'm sorry if that was a misunderstanding. It's, 
it's because the RV to PA conduit can cause distortion of the pulmonary arteries. And so they, they tend to present with cyanosis, that's sort of how they present. And then what we typically find is that their pulmonary arteries might be distorted. And so that's what's come out also in the pediatric heart network, the single ventricle reconstruction trial that they require more renal interventions. The thing that brings them to more renal intervention is that they present with cyanosis. Sure, Miguel Arapa, who doesn't say where he's from, but asks a very uh, cagey question. What is the criteria for an ineffective pulmonary artery banding by echocardiography? And I'd like to know the answer too. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think there's, pulmonary artery banding, we say it's like, it's, you know, we talk about it as if it's not a big deal um, because the surgeon just says, you know, sort of technically, I guess it's not as challenging as other things. However, it is quite tricky. You have to put the band on just right, not, not enough. And so we spend a lot of time in the operating room trying to assess whether the band is tight enough or not. And we're not always correct. And so an ineffective, I would say an ineffective pulmonary artery band is not diagnosed by echocardiography. It's, it's diagnosed by the clinical course of the patient. So yeah. if the clinical course of the patient is that they are uh, in heart failure and they're not growing properly and they're tachypnic and tachycardic, um, then we then that band, no matter what the gradient is by echocardiography, unless there's an additional source of shunting, uh, is not effective. So um, it's really not an echo diagnosis, although we get comfort by peak gradients that we see across uh, PA bands. Um, but it it doesn't, um, you know, the actual number itself is not as important as sort of the whole clinical picture. A small right. band is better than nothing. Huh? Yes, right. oh, yes, of course. Uh, we all know about this from the old days where people would band truncus arteriosus by banding the two branch pulmonary arteries. And, you know, that's a very difficult procedure to get yeah. actually right. You're more lucky yeah. than you are skillful at getting the appropriate amount. Now, I have a question from Dr. Abdul Rahman Mustafa who said, is it possible to assess the patency of a classical BT shunt using continuous wave in combination with color Doppler? Uh, yes, I mean, we do it all the time. The, what I would say about that is, you know, it's obviously see, color flow is essential to our uh, assessment of the BT shunt. Seeing flow within the, the um, shunt itself. And we use continuous wave to determine sort of what the velocity is across the BT shunt, but I caution using it to assess pulmonary artery pressure because you really can't use the modified Bernoulli equation. And Norman, you can chime in if you wish in this situation, but it really just tells you that there's adequate, you know, we look for adequate flow across it and it tells us that there's at least a pressure gradient from the aorta to the pulmonary artery, but actually trying to accurately measure the PA pressure this way is not a good idea. And again, it's serial, it's serial assessment. So if the, if the gradient across the BT shunt changes dramatically from echo to echo, then that's telling you something more so than the actual number itself. I, I don't know what you think, Norman. Well, I, I think that it's a very hard assessment. Uh, first of all, you've got the shunt and that uh, of course, um, looking at a long length velocity flow it becomes very difficult because uh, we know that the Bernoulli equation does not hold for shunt for narrowings over seven millimeters. So that's the first thing. The second thing is how do you get ideally into the pulmonary arteries? Uh, you know, uh, it's hard to get uh, an echo transducer over a, an area of uh, echo lucency where the angle is reasonable. The angle is often very difficult. Right. So that's one of the problems. And of course, the other issue is, of course, uh, the retrograde flow, the runoff uh, really affects you. But when there is very little in the way of runoff in the descending aorta, which is what I've used, mm -hmm. then I've, I'm really a bit concerned that there is uh, not adequate flow going to the, the lungs on a general basis. Yeah, that's and that's about as accurate as I can get. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, excellent point. And Doppler in the descending aorta gives you a lot of information. 
It gives you information about, you know, you can sort of make a guess at the cardiac output if the velocity uh, and ejection time are shortening. That tells you that the cardiac output is going down. It can be a dampened signal in the patients who have potentially coarctation in single ventricle. And it tells you about the retrograde flow that's going back from a BT shunt. Um, either that the shunt is narrowed or the PVR might be high is another reason why that retrograde flow may be lower. So they're, they're, th that's a really nice window on the heart to some no. degree. Well, I think we've uh, sort of exceeded our time. Uh, Meryl, you've done a beautiful job, um, an absolutely spectacular presentation. As usual, we've just come to accept that when you're appearing, that this is what we're going to expect. And also the wonderful experience that you've had working at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia with all of your great colleagues that have, uh, uh, you know, forwarded the, the science and development of this technique. Um, so, I mean, I think uh, you may want to try and answer some of these other questions uh, in, in your, your style, but I think that uh, at this time I will... Uh, uh, declare our, uh, our meeting over. Sounds good. I'll try to answer the rest of the questions at the end. Thank you, everybody. Bye, Meryl. Bye, bye, bye Sasha. Bye, Thank you. Bye, Norman. Bye, bye, Norman. Bye. bye. Thank you very much. Bye, bye.